about the origins of the book? It was actually, uh, it was in 2005, I think, or 2000. Uh, it was a, a council meeting of the University of Stellenbosch. And I had a conversation with uh, Mr. Kurs Becker, who at that stage was managing director of NASPERS. And there was a documentary on the Discovery Channel of the BBC on the, of the discovery of what is called the African Eve, that all of humanity is descending from a black woman who lived in Africa about 150 years ago. Some others put it at 80,000 years, 150,000 years ago. Others put it at 80,000 years ago. And he asked me, Oh, how long will this take to get into the history books that students and high school pupils will read? And I said about 30 years. <laughs> and he said, look, I think we must make a television documentary <laughs> about that. Uh, and so in a certain sense, uh, I pay tribute to Mr. Becker who had this vision that such a book is necessary. Yeah, Herman, can I, can I share an old memory with you? about that early, the early origins of the book. I mean, the book has a lot about the early origins of humankind mm. in Africa. But with the first edition, we were at the Cape Town um, Book Fair back then, 2008, mm. I think around then. And we were interviewed by Elna Busak. I remember that. And oh, yes. Alan Busak was right in front of the audience sitting there in his fancy mm. Gucci shoes and um, expensive suit. <laughs> and that was a funny, it was a funny moment because we were, the two of us were together on the platform and Alna was in the middle and she, you know, we had a series of questions about the book and um, what the contents were about. And then someone said that the, um, that the chapter contributors were not sort of properly identified that, you know, mm. it was, a, it was, it gave the impression of being a collective project and, you know, what was interesting who the individual authors were, you had to look carefully to see who they were. Yeah. And I remember, I remember you responded very, very well by saying that it was to get away from identities, you know, the identity of people behind chapters and to get people just to read, read it for the quality of scholarship and the quality of writing. Mm. And you then, and you then said to me, you turned to me and you said, you know, for example, my colleague here, is uh, Bill Nassen and he's um, Engelsa Kapanar from UCT, but nevertheless, he did the chapter on the anglo boer War. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> which, which got me, which got me laughing. I think we stopped them. <laughs> yes, yes, we stopped them in their tracks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, yes. Very often such books are, uh, is receives their birth from some kind of political project. But in this particular case, I think, as I said, it was the idea was Chris Becker's and that it was actually a stunning revelation about the origins of modern humankind, you know? And, uh, mm. and it's very important to have that, uh, to give South Africans a broader exposure to that idea. Yes, and I think the general idea, I mean, the emphasis that we put in the book on migration, you know, that South Africa is a sort of a conglomeration of, yeah. of migrants and migrating was, people. Yeah. And I also think that's a very important. Yeah, yeah I think to, in 2007, when the first edition appeared, we were actually in the, uh, on the brink of the Jacob Zuma years, you know, which is very, not a very good start for nation. Yes. And uh, I think uh, mm. such a book became more and more necessary to tell people, well, it's actually a very, almost a wonderful story of our, the origins of South Africa and of how we all be became South Africans, you know? There's no longer the sectional histories where you mm. had, yeah. had the British extolling their virtues or the Afrikaners extolling theirs. It's suddenly, uh, history is now everyone's history. Mm. You can't claim a separate spot uh, or a separate mm. chapter in history for you. Mm. 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 Yes, I think that, that that's a very important um, thrust of both, I mean, both versions of, of this book. Mm. The, the sense that, that, that history is almost a sort of like, you know, and to use an English term, so a maypole around which everyone can dance and, and join in. Um, and I think in this, 
and I think you know in in um, our, our, our new edition it's it's sort of helped by by the production of, you know we should say something about that I think for local publications it's extraordinarily well produced um, you know even though I'm an editor I have to say and compliment compliment the um, well, yeah. publishers no, I, on yeah I think it's also I suppose we feel that they I, I felt that was there was the, the publisher was also very good that uh, Tafelberg publishers uh, that mm. there was no constraints on us there was no suggestion of you know having a right mix of contributors and, mm. uh, and editors and so on and we had really had a free play I, I really don't, don't think we had any kind of injunction to say look we want a certain kind of history produced and so often the previous histories of South Africa had a very specific ideological pro project you know I think in the case of the Oxford history of South Africa and I think it was very valuable they brought much more uh, African people and uh, pe people of uh, colored people into the play and so on. But I don't think we actually pursued a project except to the whole idea that we're all descended from a single black woman in Africa. Mm. So very, very wonderful binding mm. element, you know. Yes, and, and I, I can't think of, again, I also can't think of, um, a comparable history of, of this kind. I mean, the, the other, there have been other histories, the, the earlier Oxford history, and if mm. you take the Cambridge history, which are much more sort of academic, more scholastically inclined, I mean, not that this is a book in which anything's dumbed down, um, mm. but this is a scholarship for that mythical category, the general reader. Um, but, you know, the, the intention behind the book is to make this to, accessible to as many people as possible including school students yeah. please yeah 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 no i think it's also uh one learned so much from such a cooperation you know i think uh, uh we we still despite the fact that uh, we are into a new non-racial order non-ethnic and so on we still meet each other so rarely you know on the marketplace you know and that uh, mm. history is like the place where we should start and say discover mm. each other's histories you know mm. yes no absolutely I, I really couldn't agree with that um with that more uh, yeah i mean that no, perhaps I can tell an umbrella a... under which yeah. yeah go ahead yeah yeah uh, no, I was. I remember. Uh, perhaps I've never told you the story before. You wrote a uh, an article on uh, the, uh, the 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 hanging of Abram Isau. Remember you had the one. That's, uh, and, uh, yeah, long time. And she was she was, she was she was a colored person who actually was actually, we must not correct me, that we, we were actually in Calfinia, was it in, uh, during the anglo War, and he was we suspected by the war force of collaborating with the British. And he was actually one of the few people, I think, that was lynched. And I was, uh, my mother, exactly. I, was I, I ran the story in the journal that I edited, the South African. They said African, I remember that. Yeah, very well. and my, my mother yeah. was so angry. She said, where do you get this story from? She, she comes from Newtville, close by. I've oh, never yeah. heard of it. But I said, yeah. oh, my mother, perhaps you should think why you've never heard of it. You know, yes. that it's, yes. uh, it yes. is actually, we have been hiding these things from each other, you know? Yes, no, it's like it's like the English and the Irish, and the, and, uh, the Irish you know, about the colonization of, of Ireland. I mean, the, the number of stories about atrocities in Ireland. Yeah. which were hidden from English yeah. uh, English readers for a long time. Yeah, no, it is, it is certainly, we've got to, we've got, sometimes I think we've got too difficult a history to, to build a new nation, but on the, on the other hand, I once met an Australian historian, and he was standing in a corner, and I asked him in, in, in a reception in London, and I asked him, what do you do? He said, I'm an Australian historian. Can you imagine anything more boring? You know? And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think we can never, never say that our history bores us. You know? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, one of the things I wondered whether you, if I could just, you know, play devil's advocate here and, and ask you whether you think a book like this or history generally 
should have some role to play in nation building in South Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, just repeat that, please. I didn't get that. Do you, do, you, do you think history has a role to play in nation building? I think history has got a fundamentally important role to play, but the, the, the great tragedy is that people, we have got university administrators and government uh, officials, government uh, cabinet ministers, we see no role for history. I remember one of my first meetings with uh, the ANC, they were still in exile and Tabu Becky was leading the ANC side and we were meeting somewhere in Germany. And I said, it'll be very important to have history that children from all the different communities could, could learn from the same textbooks and that there should actually be a, a special effort to bring history together that transcends the ethnic divisions and the racial divisions. Mm -hmm. And I'm asking, uh, I said, perhaps you should appoint, you should ask the, the ANC when it's in power, uh, appoint, uh, ask the South African Historical Society to investigate the project. No, said Tabu Mbeki, we will have such a project and we will have Afrikaner here, Bram Fischer, uh, and all the other people who supported the ANC. And uh, <laughs> I said, well, that's not the idea. <laughs> I think uh -huh. you mean, yes. uh, common heroes are very rare. I think uh, Nelson Mandela is rare in the sense that he succeeded in binding people behind his vision mm -hmm. and so on. But yes, in our history, there are very few people that transcends the different uh, color and uh, racial, mm -hmm. religious cleavages, you know? Yes, not, not, at a, not at a high sort of national level. You know, you, you, you might have had that at smaller micro local levels, people who could transcend mm. those partisan and sectional differences, but mm. not very many in, in this country. Yeah, no, we, we've got something to build on the status if mm. we're completely estranged from each other, we just we didn't know each other, you know, that you have to start knowing to uh, know start knowing each other. But uh, to some extent, I think we, uh, uh, I think uh, I feel at the moment almost as if too little attention is paid to history as not as something that children should actually learn in a parrot kind of way, but there's too little stimulation of debate about our history, you know? Mm, yes, and, and exactly about the fact that history is a, is a, is a series of stories. There isn't a single mm. There isn't a single objective story. There isn't a single yeah. story that's right yeah. or wrong. Yeah. And history shouldn't be a, a, a yeah. you know, a, a morality tale, I think, yeah. which is a problem we are settled with. Yeah, that, I think that's why in early uh, the, the, the 2002, when that television documentary and the, on the Discovery Channel was shown, you know, that it made such an impression on someone like Chris Baker and on me. I said, but here is a common theme, you know, because they look, we all descended from, from one African woman, you know, and that, that uh, humanity started that way. And then people started, the dispersal all over the world started. And uh, I think it is just a wonderful uh, metaphor for the United hmm. Nation, you know, all the other stuff, you know, like... Uh, uh, Springwalk rugby teams, that's uh, it's, it's really nothing substantial, you know, but... Uh, yes, the that's ephemeral. Of, the yeah, ephemeral, yeah. 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 The idea yeah. of a common ancestor and that it is all from, from an African Eve, it is something that one could say, look, we are, that's where we are coming from, you know. Mm. Yes, oh yeah, no, yeah. Mm. Um, I mean, I was asked by a, by a couple of people, I, I did a sort of radio interview about the book, uh, a couple of weeks ago and after that I was asked by a couple of people who emailed me and said well why is it called new history of yeah. um, South Africa and they found yeah. the title puzzling yeah you know why were we leaving out the prefix why hadn't we called it the new history of yeah. South Africa well I think in South Africa we can certainly say that our history previously up till very recently has been used to divide us you know mm -hmm. and for the Sunday this is a very concerted effort to, to address all South Africans and to say, look, there is a common wish, a common past, and there can be a common vision for the future. But I don't think we really started out on a specific ideological enterprise, but uh, uh, I think that to a large extent, uh, we were very fortunate in having a couple of people, historians working on uh, new, uh, new, new on, on books and the themes that was not well documented, not well described, and so on. Mm. So 
So because South African uh, scholarship in, in history is quite strong, but it hasn't been appropriately <clears throat> used, it hasn't been brought into school textbooks and so on, you know. Mm. Uh, mm. I saw this as a wonderful opportunity that one could actually have, uh, say to ch school children, we were all, we all descended from mm. one African woman, the African Eve, you know, and therefore mm. afterwards, we spread out all over the world and now in South Africa, we've come together again, you know. We, mm. Sometimes one needs myth making, you know, but of a very uh, careful kind, you know, you can't, you can't <laughs> easily get out of hand. <laughs> yeah, yes. I mean, the, the, the great Welsh historian Gwyn Williams has a wonderful, um, has a wonderful phrase about that. And he says that all, all nations need myths, you know, they need yeah. creation myths. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so that the Australians, one of the Australian myths was that the country was born in the anglo boer War because it emerged yeah. in 1901 and the, and the New Zealanders have their myths and the yeah. Canadians have their myths linked to the First World War. And mm. he says that, um, but, you know, countries need to remember, you need, more than, you, you need more than a myth, you need a myth that walks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's why I think it's, itself. Yeah. It's, uh, and I believe we're getting a new school syllabus next year, but I've never seen any, I was never any conferences, any meetings, there no one, the department asked no one's advice, you know. So no, I, no. I, I shudder to think what we will be getting, you know. I've seen a glimpse and it's very discouraging. Let's just leave it at that. Yes, mm -hmm. very predictable new version of nationalist history, which is what. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, I fear the schools will be saddled with. Yeah, yeah, and even even history, we I mean, people try to experiment with new areas. You know, starting to study the history of animals and so on. You know, I mm. I think it's really very ephemeral. I think we mm. have, we have to think about the state of our history, and I think people in both school at, at universities and high schools should start talking about it and say, look, what will be the best the way in which to teach history and uh, what what are the elements that we want to emphasize without uh, lapsing into propaganda, you know? Oh, yes, I know. And I think, I mean, I think in a way, if you start, if you start doing history at sort of lower levels, in a way, you should start with the really big questions. Yeah, yeah, yes. And you no, can I do all the very specialized it. stuff later. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I mean, I was an undergraduate, when I was an undergraduate in Britain, we, I did a course um, and it included the First World War when I was in my second year at university. Mm. And one of the exam questions was, in 1914, everyone thought the First World War would be long, full stop. Why was it, would be short rather, would be short, full stop. And the question was, why was it so long? <laughs> so, yeah, Which, yeah. yeah. I know what. Yes, I thought it would be quick, over quickly, yeah, no, that is the yeah. classic mistake that politicians make, you know, that said a brief, conclusive war, you know, and yes. very, very, yeah. very few wars are like that. Look at the anglo boer War, you know, it was supposed to be over in uh, six weeks, you know, and then it weeks, just dragged yes. on and yeah. totally changed the political context. Uh, yeah, no, I think in our case, I think we have got a, the book that we did all together. It was, what was it, 26 collaborators it's from all the different uh, sections of the, of the, of the mm -hmm. nation. It was a wonderful exercise. I don't think we had any disagreements, you know, uh, in the sense that, look, I think that person is not equipped to write that particular uh, topic, you know. It helped yes. that I had the decision-making power. I didn't have a team mm. of editors, you know. That well, I that's could... very good, that, yes. No, I think uh, I think it's a lot to be said for democratic centralism. <laughs> <laughs> look, you could take democracy too far, huh? <laughs> yes. Oh, yes, no. <laughs> Especially as if it know, comes to the editing as we, know, as we know from our present rulers, they know yeah. that too. Let's not yeah. take democracy too yeah. far. Yes. No, I don't. I, you know, I can remember no any uh, any lack of any 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 angry arguments. I can uh, it, in this book. It was it was actually very rare for history books because I want to heard of blood on the floor and so on and other cases of other books. Mm. We were able to do it very peacefully, and I think mm. I remember I, I also uh, one of the uh, see, uh, Chris Becker, I think, knows very well how to deal with academics. He gave us one year to uh, finish the text. Mm. 
mm. of that first edition that came out in 2007. But there was a catch that if it's not finished within one year, you know, you'll have to give all the money back. Yes. And, <laughs> yes. And I said, look, there is no extension. If you don't meet your deadline, you're out, you know. And mm. uh, yeah. I think that is the mm. only way in which I, mean, I think we will still be having our arguments if we didn't mean it. Oh, no, to... indeed. I think it, it really concentrates the mind, especially yeah. with the underpaid academics, you know. The, yeah. Yeah. the rare prospect that for once they'll be paid reasonably well for their writing. Will yeah. concentrate the mind wonderfully, and it did. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, uh, well, I suppose we uh, we we will have, we will have to wait for see for for another edition. But the first two editions actually was marketed well. I think it sold fifteen. The first edition sold fifteen thousand in both mm. Africa and the English edition. Mm. Uh, I believe yeah. the orders for this edition is also very good. Yeah, it's a market, there is a need uh, mm. people would like to know. I think we should actually persuade someone to make a, 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 a television doc, documentary a series, you know, that I was very fortunate in the case of the book that I wrote on the Afrikaners. I, I got an invitation to, you know, to uh, for a, doc, a documentary series, which was broadcast of about 15 episodes, one hour episodes. And mm. uh, the modern medium actually is uh, documentaries rather than mm. books, you know, and then the people mm. that could turn to the books after seen the, after they haven't seen the documentary. Mm. Yes, no, I, I, I think that's, a, that's an excellent proposal, an mm. idea we should, uh, we should yeah. get, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think also that, you know, one of the things the book does, I mean, cumulatively, if you, you know, it's one of these books, you can't sort of sit down and read it from cover to cover, you know, it's, um, it's almost 700 yeah. pages. Yeah. Um, but one of the, one of the things, I mean, having gone through it uh, more than once, is that it's, it's, it's one of these large books that kind of, without sounding pat, I mean, that answers a so large question, why South Africa the way it is? Why South Africa, not Kenya or Uganda or anywhere yeah. else in Africa? Yeah. No, it doesn't. Uh, it, it never really pans out the way in what in which one thinks it would it would pan mm -hmm. out. You know, I think. Uh, uh, remember, I remember. Oh, no, I, uh, well, it's remarkable how little one actually know of the way in which politicians think. Uh, I remember in the early. In the early, what what was it in uh, in the early nineties? Uh, mm. I asked a, a national party cabinet minister, "Look, I hope you've got your plans in order for this negotiations, and that you would uh, arrange for a very good federal order, so mm. that if the Western Cape, the Western part of the country, wants to su su succeed, mm. there wouldn't be any problems." So I was saying it was tongue in the cheek. Mm. <laughs> and yeah. he looked at me aghast and he said, "What will then happen to us?" And that's uh, his <laughs> constituency was in the Transvaal. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just somehow it had, yeah. I had a trick that I was, I was devising a escape route for the Western Cape, but uh, he said, well, you will leave us in the lurch. Is, is in that, the lurch? Your, stuck, that your intention? Stuck up. Yes, no, stuck up the wrong side. Of, yeah, the wrong side of, um, yeah. yeah. Yes. But uh, I remember always the famous conversation between Andre Stockenstrom and, uh, Peter Tiff, uh, Andre Stockenstrom was a uh, uh, Commissioner General of the East yeah. Cape in 18, 1838. Mm -hmm. And the Peter Tiff was going on this great trek, and Stockenstrom tried to dissuade him. And Peter Tiff said, No, I can't stay any longer under the British. And he said, Look, he said, What are you going to do? You're going to spread yourself out very thinly over a large area. And how are you going to defend yourself in the end, you know? And uh, people, mm, yes. I, I can cope. And uh, but uh, mm. so <laughs> uh, what happened to him? But uh, it is actually uh, people really don't think uh, carefully about what they the, what they wish, you know. And they make they may actually be shocked to see what they get when they when their wish is fulfilled. <laughs> but um, in a certain sense, South Africans, I've, I've got a great faith in the ability of. South Africa to struggle through the difficulties, not, not really, uh, you know, uh, collapsing or capsizing or whatever, but just going on, you know, because there's no alternative. 
Well, yes. I mean, I think it's, there's, you know, this country is a long history that we know of, you know, Boudmakaplan and Alasal yeah. uh, Rechkong. And, 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 sort of, and that's the sort of oxygen on which it lives. You just yeah. hope that the oxygen remains around because the number <laughs> of times you yeah. teeter on the edge, not least at, at, at the present, is... Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's alarming. It's it's not as you, it's not a country for an Australian historian. It'll be too yeah. too exciting. Yeah. Yeah. No, I uh, I feel we uh, we have got much to grab to be much. We've got much to be grateful for. You know that, and the fact that I mean, uh, I in fact think we can do a bit more to try and encourage uh, I mean students and school children to to debate. You know, mm. I. Uh, I occasionally uh, 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 give lectures at the at the at the at the, at the, at the um, girls' schools here in Stellenbosch. Mm -hmm. What interests me is how much uh, children are uh, we get interested if you ask them. Uh, you know, think about history. Think, put yourself back in history. This is the situation here. Uh, what would you do? What what is what do you think are your options? And and uh, plan your plan your escape or plan your survival, you know. And then mm. suddenly it starts getting very very more much more interesting, you know. Mm. Yes, yes. When you have options and and choices and limited yeah. choices, yeah. Where, where you know where you go. There's that wonderful yeah. book I used to use in teaching years ago, The Art of War by Sun yeah. Tzu. Uh, yeah. which is all about strategy and choice and um, what to do yeah. if you're in a corner. Yeah. yeah. I, I, uh, I sometimes when I, mean, I take, go and talk to white uh, girls' schools, I said, look, I said, uh, what, what would you do? You, you're a little uh, orphan girl coming from, a white girl coming from uh, Holland, from an orphanage, and you're coming to Cape Town. And it's a slaveholding society, 18th century. Mm. What would you do to try and uh, build a future for yourself? Mm. <laughs> uh, and uh, how, would you, how, would you, how would you plan to get a husband for yourself? Uh, because you're poor, you've got no parents. That I mean, it's just you're mm. orphan. Mm. You're poor, and uh, I said, look. Uh, and then they would struggle along, and I said, I said, well, why, why didn't you try uh, joining a church? Mm. I said, but what does that got to do with finding mm. a husband? <laughs> <laughs> said, yeah, it's got everything to do with finding a husband. You're most likely to yeah. find your husband there. You know, your future yeah. husband there. Mm. Uh, and I and then uh, I would ask school children, why do you think? There is so few, uh, when you read the, uh, the descriptions of visitors to American frontier farms, uh, American slaveholding farms, there's very often descriptions of uh, children who, was, who were born out of wedlock. And very often, and very often the master, the master of, the, of the plantation was the father of those children. And I said, why don't you re read about the same stories of South African farms? And uh, then they will start puzzling, you know. And I said, look, have you ever looked at the divorce laws? In the case of the Roman Dutch law, if uh, the woman sues the husband, say, on the, on, the grounds, on the grounds of adultery, he perhaps had a relationship with his slave woman, she gets half the estate. And so so it's a very great risk what you that, that little flirtation of yours, you may lose half your estate. Do you think that's a powerful deterrent? You know, <laughs> then they start asking, how serious is this? Yes. You know, they, never, they never know whether I'm serious or not, you know, but uh, yes. I said, this, yes. this is actually yeah. the, the state of play. Mm. Yeah. And, and very yeah. often, if you look at the history books, the older history books, and it's all to do about Calvinism. It's got nothing to do with it. It's with losing half your estate. Actually, yes, yes, yeah. No, it's like, you know, at another level, starting out with a proposition that uh, history shows that in the 20th century, South Africa was a very, is, was a very safe country in which to live. Yeah, and no one asked why. And of course, and of course the present, the present would say, my God, you know, look at the murder rate and uh, violent yeah. assault and so on. But then you, but then you say, but actually just think about it, you know, 
in a in a general historical sense uh, compare mm -hmm. it with Europe. Yeah, yeah. So I also mean the genocide, kind of, world wars, and South yeah. Africa's had the Spanish yeah. flu and AIDS, and uh, yeah. but relatively speaking, yeah. it's no, been safe. I I also I had uh, what I once uh, for the first edition. I I don't think we've got it in this edition, but the first edition is there is what I call a, a atrocity league. I mean, where was the greatest political killings, uh, political deaths? You know, both on the side of the armed forces, but also on the, on the side of the of the population that was in 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 in, in insurrect, what was in the state of insurrection against the government. And I put it together, I, you know, that is the, the so-called political deaths that count those who died in prison or in the hands of the police, plus also those in the case of the dominant population, those who were killed. Mm -hmm. And so, and I what seven or eight countries, and of course Algeria was first, and uh, I think Cambodia was second. Yeah. South Africa was last. Yes, and yes. Uh, it is we, we were I think lower than Northern Ireland, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and so you must ask, you know, we you know, tell me why did that happen? Now, obviously, it couldn't have happened if there hadn't been some kind of uh, discipline on the part of the different leadership, both mm -hmm. on the on the part of those who were in, 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 uh, upris in a, engaged mm. in an uprising mm. against the state and both in the case of the government. They must realize, mm. hey, look, we must still live together. There can't be killings right to left, right to center. Mm. And people simply can't believe it, you know. I, uh, they say, look, this is impossible. I said, well, this is the figures mm. that we have. It means all has been documented. Mm. There's very, very few political killings that is hidden, you know, and so on, that mm. never, never, never yeah. exposed. Mm. And that is one of the funny things people do. Mm. And I think it takes responsible leadership mm. on both sides, you know, both on the government side and, and the mm. radical side that challenges them, you know. Mm. Yeah. Yes, but the, then these are the uncomfortable truths mm. which history brings us. Yeah. Uncomfortable yeah. for those who don't like to hear them or wouldn't want to hear them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, no, they are, sometimes yeah. I get the impression if I listen to some people, they want South Africa, in fact, to, do, to be the opposite, to hit the atrocity league in the world, you know, then they could say, look, mm, yes. look at the terrible past that we, you know, they want the super league yes. of suffering, you know, and, uh, mm, but South yes. Africa, I mean, I would, they don't want to belittle the suffering mm. that people did suffer, you know, and the deprivation mm. and the lost chances and so on, mm. but in terms of actual killings, you know, that's a different story, mm. actually. Yes, I mean, the, the provocative, um, uh, Oxford historian Norman Stone once once wrote that no nation, any nation worth its salt, must have its genocide and atrocity. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't have that in your history, you're not yeah. a proper nation. That yeah. got him into a lot of a lot yeah. of trouble <laughs> at the time. But yeah. you can see what he was getting at. Yeah. Yes. You know, South Africa, I think we still haven't quite got to discover, we haven't fully uncovered, you know, what holds South Africa together. We so often write and mm. talk about what divides us, you know, but there's something that holds us together, you know, and even, even now in the, the government that's not actually in full control always, mm. you know, there's always some kind of uh, safety mechanisms and so on, some kind of way. Yes. We, mm. Yes, I mean, in a way, but you know, in a way, is it that is it? There must be other societies like this in the world, which which function despite the state, mm. or despite the governments they have. Mm. They're not necessarily mm. resisting or acting against the authorities mm. who attempt to order their lives, but the societies still function yeah. on a daily basis, and we both know this, you know, in our daily lives. Yeah, yeah, no, it is. But what it is, I mean, what it is, what the fuel is, or the glue, or the oil that holds it all together mm. and mm. keeps it going is, um, yes, eludes me. No, certainly, yeah, no, we, uh, we want to actually be very thankful, you know, there is a certain degree of restraint on, on all sides, you know, that mm. the actually it's a realization that we have. <laughs> We've only got each other. No one's going to come and rescue us. You know, we have to sort it out ourselves. You know. Yes, yes. There, there won't be any blue light brigades uh, on the way to Oar Tambo or Cape Town Airport. 
thanks thanks very much and and good to see you see herman and Thank and, you. Um, nice and it's, uh, let me just say it's been a, a great treat and privilege to be part of this venture with you and um may this book launch a thousand more books <laughs> let's let's hope <laughs> okay yeah. okay thanks a lot keep well Hello. thank you bye